This video is made possible with the support of our fantastic patrons. You guys are the best. River and sea, jungle and sky, water flows freely between the two halves of the world. We are creatures of the water. Hello everyone and welcome back to another deck tech brought to you by Affinity for Commander. Today we're looking at one of the best Voltron Commanders of recent printings. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you, garbage. A real Planeswalker's Voltron. Tuvasa the Sun Lit is one green, one white, and one blue for a 1-1 one, one legendary creature Merfolk Shaman. She reads, Tuvasa the Sun Lit gets plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control. And, whenever you cast your first enchantment spell each turn, draw a card. One of the main things Voltron strategies can get stuck on is a lack of card advantage. You power up one huge guy and then someone casually merciless evictions you and you're sent back to the Stone Age with next to no cards in your hand to recover with. Tuvasa solves this problem, allowing you to draw an additional card a turn for simply playing enchantments. Just perfect. This draw ability also has unusual wording, allowing you to draw a card for the first enchantment you play each turn. If only there was some way in Bant Colors to let us play enchantments at instant speed. Oh, those'll do. Leyline of Anticipation I do favor over Vidalcan Ori in this case, as not only is it an enchantment to buff our commander, but if the stars align, we can start the game with it in play. Because, you know, fair and balanced magic. Speaking of buffing our commander, Tuvasa's first ability is also something that sets her apart from a lot of other Voltron commanders, in that she doesn't require her buffing cards to be attached to her. This means that we are not limited to playing only auras, giving us a wider card pool to choose from. Our ramping enchantments, such as Fertile Ground, Overgrowth, and Wild Growth all also buff our general. Or, if we're looking to drop all the lands from our hand as quickly as possible, both burgeoning and exploration are also great for this deck. One of my personal all-stars in this deck is Karametra, God of Harvests. Every time we cast a creature, we'll be grabbing lands out of our deck and putting them straight onto the battlefield. And she reads a Plains or Forest card. So grabbing shock lands or cycle lands can also help with fixing, should we need it. And with enough devotion, she can also be a 6-7 indestructible beater, which is also pretty nice. Keeping with this theme of gods, Heliod, God of the Sun, Nylea, God of the Hunt, and Thassa, God of the Sea are all excellent additions, but for completely different reasons. Heliod can give our creatures a vigilance, allowing us to still have blockers after we've swung in with Tuvasa. He can also generate a 2-1 enchantment creature, that not only serve as good blockers, but can also give our commander an additional plus one plus one for each token. A neat little combat trick if I do say so myself. Nylea, meanwhile, gives our commander the all-important keyword, Trample and is also a great mana dump for any excess mana we happen to have floating around. Finally, Thassa gives us pseudo card advantage by allowing us to scry every upkeep and threatens to give our huge merfolk unblockable, meaning all your blockers are puny compared to my auras. I can't tell you the amount of times Thassa has just came in to steal a game by giving Tuvasa unblockable. A personal favorite win con of mine. Now this wouldn't be a very good deck tech without mentioning our sweet draw package. Our Enchantresses. Or, should we say, Enbantresses? I'm sorry, I'll show myself out. Our Gothian Enchantress, Enchantress's Presence, Eidolon of Blossoms, Mesa Enchantress, and Satya Enchanter. Drawing multiple cards each turn is one of the major things that lets Tuvasa keep the pressure on and stay ahead of everyone else at the table. Turns usually consist of play an enchantment, draw two, play another enchantment, draw again, play this other enchantment I just drew, draw a card, and so on and so on and so on. Along with Eidolon of Blossoms, the deck runs a respectable amount of other enchantment creatures. 
including Corsa of Crufix, Kestia the Cultivator, and Aegis of the Gods. These creatures allow us to play lands on the top of our libraries and gain life, draw cards, and give us Hexproof, respectively. No making a sacrifice to Vasa today. These guys not only buff to Vasa, but we draw a card when we play them. That is value. Another fantastic creature here is Herald of the Pantheon. They not only reduce the cost of our enchantments, but also gain us one life per enchantment we play. Which, when we're dropping anywhere from 2 to 5 in a turn, that can add up quite quickly. We've also got solid recursion creatures with Auromancer and Monk Idealist. Grabbing back some of our important enchantments, Hanna, Ship's Navigator, can also do this each turn for us. But we actually need some enchantments to get back, so let's get on to the meat of this deck. Now, way back in the distant past of 2010, Rise of the Eldrazi was released, and with it an attempt to make ores less of an immediate 2 for 1 for your opponents with the introduction of Totem Armor. Bear Umbra, Snake Umbra, and Eel Umbra all provide their own solid additions to the deck, powering up and also saving our commander from one-time destroy effects. Bear Umbra helps us by being one half of Sword of Feast and Famine, Snake Umbra lets us draw more cards, and Eel Umbra's Flash offers good versatility, with being able to give our commander an immediate plus two plus two, or can even act as just a one-time thing of Grant Indestructible, and draw a card in our opponent's turn. Other ways of protecting our merfolk are with Shield of the Oversoul and Alpha Authority. With Tuvas, the shield is essentially 3 mana for plus 3, plus 3, flying and indestructible, and draw a card, while Alpha Authority prevents multiple blockers and gives Tuvasa hexproof and an additional plus 1 and draws a card. Not bad for 2 mana. And of course, Daybreak Coronat. Coronate? Coronet? Makes a great addition to our arsenal, offering keyword soup and again, drawing a card. And if the high value of 21 commander damage is just too much for us to ask, or we're in a rush home to let the dog out, then Corrupted Conscience is great for giving Tuvasa Infect, or even just stealing our opponent's big creatures and giving them Infect. And once again, drawing a card. Our non-aura enchantments can help with everything else that our deck could need. We've already covered Ramp, but cards like Land Tax and Mana Bloom are really helpful for accelerating us and making sure that we never miss a land drop. And I just love playing Mana Bloom where X is zero, so that I can draw a card and bounce it back to my hand, only to replay it again next turn. Amazing. Our enchantments can also be used as removal, with cards such as Dark Soul Mutation, Imprisoned in the Moon, and Song of the Dryads, getting rid of any annoying creatures or even permanents. You thought Soren being stuck in a wall was bad? Try having your commander being turned into a tree. Oh, and did I mention Finest Hour is a ridiculously good card? Because Finest Hour is a ridiculously good card. Now the deck, as you might expect, runs very few non-enchantment, non-creature spells. But the few we do run really pull their weight. Now everyone knows tutors like Idealic and Enlightened are really good for a deck like this. But having cards that can save all of our permanents from an ill-timed bane of progress are worth their weight in gold. Heroic Intervention and Teferi's Protection help save not only our commander, but everything attached to her as well. Now, you don't really need me to tell you Teferi's Protection is a great card, but this card right here, brilliant. Winds of Wrath, on the other hand, is just one of those super cheap, super funny cards that will decimate our opponent's board, but leave our beefy merfolk completely untouched. And this one is very risky. It's definitely not a card you can slam down the second you draw it, but Open the Vaults is a much cheaper version of the reserved list's Replenish, 
it sees all those great enchantments that our opponents have destroyed being brought right back onto the battlefield. Now, it does return our opponent's artifacts and enchantments as well. So, if someone is playing a prayer deck at the table, you might have to accept that this card is just sometimes not worth playing. But more often than not, it can just be 6 mana, I win the game. But what happens when somebody has disabled our commander? Or turned them into a tree? And we need another route to victory? Well, as stated, beating face with indestructible gods is always one way to go. But it is very uncivilized. Let's instead beat face with enchantments. Starfield of Nyx and Opalescence let us move in and start attacking with our enchantments willy-nilly, even equipping them with our own aura spells. Tell me that you've never wanted to see a 10-10 burgeoning with totem armor kill someone. But obviously this is super risky, as if someone board wipes we now lose all of our enchantments, so do be careful. If the ground is too clogged up with creatures, then flyers are surely the way to go. Sigil of the Empty Throne and Luminarch Ascension can see us churning out angels faster than a Tostani play with Divine Visitation in play. Such a fun way to win. Moving on to the lands of the deck, there are a few special ones I want to give particular mention to, such as Reliquary Tower, because you are going to be drawing a lot of cards, and Starfield of Nyx. This is kind of a staple in a lot of permanent heavy decks, but with a lot of our enchantments being quite mana intensive, this land is great for helping us ramp and drop more of our hand in a single turn. The last land I want to mention is Homeward Path, because nothing, and I mean nothing, hurts more than someone stealing your buffed up commander and killing you with your own commander damage. Trust me, I've been there. Tuvasa the Sun Lit offers not only a different style of Voltron deck, she also provides some things that others surely lack. Draw power, alternative win conditions, a cheap mana cost, and not needing your buff spells to be attached to her. This deck can even be just half enchantment value with bits of Voltron and even just a dash of Pillarfort thrown in, and Tuvasa would still be a threat to the table. Overall, I find her to be an exceptionally fun and really underrated commander with exceptional synergies and probably the most deserving to be ahead of an Enbantress deck. And that's it for another deck tech, what do you think of our banterful merfolk? I'm sorry I swear we'll stop now. Are there any synergies I've missed out or auto includes you found for her? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to see more of this type of content then let us know by liking and subscribing. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at 4commander. And if you really like us, you could consider supporting us on Patreon. Links are in the description. As always, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.